speaker is Peter Saville, who as a graphic designer is of course very well known for the work he did with Factory Records in Manchester in the 1980s. And it was during that period that he worked very closely with Ben Kelly when Ben designed the Hacienda in Manchester. So now Peter is going to go back in time a little to the apartment, which was an apartment in Mayfair where he lived in the 1990s. And again, he worked on it with Ben who helped him to restore the apartment and reconfigure it. So over to Peter, Q. Thank, thank you, Alice. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm gonna go even further back, just first of all, to sort of 40 years ago, um, I realize. Um, when I went off to study graphic design um, in, in Manchester, um, uh, principally because it seemed to me as a kind of as a teenager in my late teens, um, route one into into pop culture, which is sort of where I kind of wanted to belong. Um, I think it's one of the dangers of foundation courses and decisions that you have to make really on, early on in life. And uh, um, thinking about it earlier today, I feel that foundation courses should probably last at least four years, uh, and and give us all a chance to um, know a little bit more about the world we're going to enter into rather than the one we know already, um, and to help inform the decisions we make. Anyway, it's not like that yet. Maybe it will be one day. Um, anyway, I went to study graphics, and yet it was the it was the broader context of, of pop, kind of particularly post-war pop, that actually interested me, um, and that informed my sort of thinking or my awareness to that point and particularly actually this place and and the independent group and the talks and seminars that they held here back in the late 50s and that was pop was one of the things that i knew something about culturally as a as a teenager and um the independent group in general and particularly uh, richard hamilton um who andrew is going to talk about um, in a few minutes when I finish. Um, and Hamilton was a sort of formative um, experience for me. Works such as just what is it that in a way kind of asks the sort of found, founding question of the relationship to creativity and art in, in you know, the late 20th century. And then particular works such as Toaster, um, and, and this work, Lobby, with the origins of which are in the mid-70s when I was at art school, Toaster and this propose um, kind of issues about art and life and, and art's relationship to life and life's relationship to art. And when I kind of recall the place that I went to, at the college I went to every day, there was a sign saying Faculty of Art and Design. And I think I understood design as a young person as the interface between art and the kind of reality or reality that, that I knew in this country sort of 40 years ago. Because um, of that broader interest in, in pop culture, um, I was, when I was at school, I was more interested in what the fashion school were doing, what the product people were doing, what the interior people were doing. And I kind of pursued that when I came to London in 79. And one of the first very important people I met was Ben. And, um, we kind of, in a way, symbolically, we met at, at this doorway. It was a kind of threshold. It was a project that he'd done um, in late 70s. And I asked him a question one evening about a problem I had about a space frame. And he said, go and look at Lynn's door on the way home, Lynn Franks being effectively the Mrs. Howie of this place. And it, um, that d the, the material used on the door led, led to that, um, which was a, one of my early album covers informed entirely by that door and as a kind of collaboration between Ben and I. That was the next collaboration. Ben's, um, or my debt to Ben, in those early record covers or the OMD one in particular, um, tried to repay a little bit in the work he did at the Hacienda. But the, the collaboration was just sort of, from the collaboration on this was nothing really more than my suggesting that Ben do the Hacienda and uh, the, the, the little nameplate outside where some typography and some um, <clears throat> very small bit of marble, where's Lucy, sorry, um, a very small piece of, of or polished granite perhaps that was used. Um, you know, I mean, 
there's different ways to be successful. Uh, I was kind of successful by reputation, but not by wealth, and never really had a space, never had a space other than the sort of, you know, the modest studio that I could afford, and never really kind of lived anywhere other than somewhere to go home and sleep. Um, and it wasn't actually until sort of 20 years later, till the mid 90s, that I actually got to do something with this space, or I got the opportunity to do something in a space. And um, uh, unusually, it was this space, a kind of a modernist block on Hill Street in Mayfair, and that sort of 60s modernist block was there because of that. Um, so at some point <coughs> during a war, um, whatever had been there before had gone, and so the kind of unusual consequence of a sort of modernist building in, you know, traditional Mayfair kind of had occurred. Along the way to that opportunity in Mayfair coming up in the mid 90s, um, I had begun to reappreciate, rediscover in a way the, the things that I'd grown up with or the times which I'd grown up in. My, my kind of grand tour through secondhand bookshops of postmodernism. Um, had brought me round by the mid 80s to kind of where I'd set off in the first place. So the prevailing culture of, of the 60s and early 70s, which I'd grown up in, I kind of rediscovered to some extent in, in or started to rediscover in the mid 80s. I remember I came across this book in a secondhand bookshop in, in uh, Oxfordshire. Um, in the window on a Sunday afternoon and was so obsessed by what it was suggesting to me that I had to go back there the next day, went all the way back to Oxford the next day to get it. Um, and, you know, I'm, there's no need for me to mention the cover, but also, you know, this was kind of interesting. The, the graphic aesthetic in, in the context of the interior is about as obvious as you can get in some of this early work of, of David Hicks. Um, Building on from that um, was this kind of fantasy. Um, by 1990, um, disappearing in in my own copy of Penthouse or Playboy magazine from uh, from 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 the 60s and 70s as well, and um, having sort of <coughs> managed to stay single all the way through my 30s and into my 40s, um, I kind of had some fantasy playboy life that I wanted to live before it got too late. Um, and this particular, this particular bedroom is just uh, um, embarrassingly epitomizes um, that, that part of my imagination at that time. And, but, but practically speaking as well, this is, this is a quite rare picture of Carlo Molino himself in one of his apartments in, in Turin. Um, I was fortunate enough the other year to visit the last remaining one and it was truly fascinating to actually see how he had constructed uh, an apartment entirely as a, as a versatile um, photo studio. Um, and I liked that idea, the, I mean, it's that sort of synergy between life and work and where you live and what you think and what you do and the idea of a place itself becoming part of the work um, you know seemed evident to me and, and that was you know that was that was the premise upon which Ben um, kind of helped me realize this place where I was going to live for a little while um, I had notions of what I wanted to do but of course none of the craft or the know-how or the experience to do it and so Ben helped me achieve it and you know we found a kind of a hybridity between the two of us in this space. It, it was actually a kind of a playboy apartment. It, was, it had belonged to an Indian millionaire who lived in Delhi and who visited London and went to the Playboy Club and had this flat done out as an annex of the Playboy Club. Um, it had become run down and shabby and one of his sons had lived in it for a year or so and it was kind of trashed and it was unlettable. It was 1994, 95. Nobody wanted to spend any money to sell it. It wasn't a great time to try and sell a property anyway. Nobody wants to spend any money to refurbish it for the kind of what the corporate letting market. So it was just a kind of white elephant. And I came across it looking for a location for a photo shoot. I wanted to do a Scarface style 70s inspired photo shoot with my friend Nick Knight. Saw this place and it turned out that it was actually 
lettable. Some friends from Germany who were prepared to kind of fund me for a little while on an experiment in London, they provided you know, a modest budget and we kind of, we did a makeover really. The surfaces got improved, the, it got recarpeted. But all of the best found things, black, black, black mirrored walls, um, the Werner Panton light you can see, well, we'll I'll talk through it. Um, the lobby, um, the glass, the tinted glass lobby, which which changed the color. There was this odd height, this odd color, this kind of acidic fluorescent yellow that we chose as a generic color. And it was interesting to see how that responded to, to different lighting conditions and actually seeing it through different shades of glass. The, the yellow wall is in fact the same color as the, the dark green kind of lobby interior. It's just the effect of the dark glass. Um, the sofa was there. It's a dissed sofa that you could, you know, big enough to sleep on or several people to sleep on probably. Um, the Werner Panton light was there. So all of the things that were great that were there we kept and we just kind of, you know, made over the other things. There were some unpleasant old silk curtains which had to go and the vertical blinds came in which were, you know, we see them everywhere now. Back in the early 90s they were a kind of um, clunky memory from the 70s but it was really effective to, to use them in this space. It was, you know, it was my workplace. Um, intended as a kind of a, a sort of salon and a meeting place, my colleague from Germany, Mike Murray, uh, would come, we would do some projects together, we would meet people, and obviously its location on Hill Street in Mayfair near Berkeley Square made it very drop-inable. Nobody ever had any problem about dropping in. Um, and, and, but that was the point of it. Um, <clears throat> pristine desk where I managed to do very little work. I think it, any work I did was done on that sofa. Um, but it was an opportunity to just do things I'd never done before. You know, somewhere to find that, put that old ashtray that you, you know, you bought in a kind of junk shop or whatever some years earlier. Um, I kind of miss it now. I don't have anywhere to put anything, so it's all in storage. Um, and there was the kind of Hicks style juxtaposition of things. This is a prop from a New Order cover from the late 80s. It's Louis XIV. And um, it's kind of interesting how you can import um, the out of place into spaces once they're stripped down enough. Um, reflected in that mirror there is, that, is a glitter painting from a man called Martin McGinn. That, was, um, that fitted there just as well as Louis did. There was a dark suede or velvet suede bedroom with blue mirror. Um, as you can see, the mannequins in this, the whole place was done on a budget, and so the girls were on a budget as well. Um, there's some photo manne mannequins imported for a El Deco shoot. Um, blue mirror and, and, and blue velvet walls a pair of interesting Indian bedside lamps. They were, there were all of these kind of like unusual things that were totally usable. I'm having to shoot through this. The, there was a great black bathroom. It just needed a new wash basin. Otherwise, it was kind of ready to go. The kitchen was a bit of a horror. It was tongue and grooved with farmhouse handles. Um, we had no budget to fix it. Ben suggested that we paint our way out of it, so which we did. We, <laughs> The acidic yellow got us out, and some new. It's amazing, actually, what a bit of paint and some and some you know new new cupboard handles can do. Um, and um, our credible version of marble was actually made of waste. Uh, ben introduced me to, to the made of waste plastic, so the entire kitchen surface was 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 uh, created out of made of waste. Um, it did become a bit of a place for people to drop in. Um, uh, Sam Taylor Wood came, did one of her panoramic p pictures in there, um, and in a way captured a little bit the spirit of it as a kind of place where things would happen and people would come and go. Um, Jarvis phoned me up. He saw it in a magazine, phoned me up and said, um, I, he, I knew him, but I didn't really know him. We'd never worked together. He phoned me up to say he was doing a project with Pulp. And he'd seen the pictures of the apartment and could he come and discuss a project with me? That project um, became an album called This Is Hardcore. We, it was coming from the same place, but we went off to shoot it in the Hilton, round the corner from the apartment. Um, this is the 
top floor bar of the Hilton. Um, and then some shots didn't work, so we did kind of what you might call pickup in the apartment. Um, slightly embarrassing picture, but thank God it's not me. Um, um, we shot pickup pictures for This Is Hardcore in the album, uh, um, uh, in the apartment, and played around with things like this, from which came that. Um, it's quite odd. By the time this was on the back of London buses, it was weird for me to see your, you see your own living room five times real size going round town. Um, it was an, an interesting kind of controversy over this image. It, uh, London Transport allowed us to have the image, but not the, the words, this is hardcore. Or pulp, this is hardcore, without the image. But <laughs> they would not allow this is hardcore and that image on the back of a bus, quite, quite rightly. Um, I have to finish, but a few years later, well, actually quite a, quite a few years later, back in, I think, 2009, Tony Chambers invited me to recreate the mythology of the apartment in, in wallpaper. Um, Anna Blessman, who Alice mentioned, Anna volunteered to help me. We had a, we had a fantasy that it being editorial, it could become something that was related to the work we were doing at the time about the relationship between body and form and space. It didn't really go that way. There was the reality of edit well, re even editorial has a reality these days. And, and there was a lot of pressure to include product. Um, in the end, we had to just make what we could out of the circumstances. My friend Nick Knight shot it. It was kind of fun, at least. It was fun um, for a few days to recreate something. It was kind of like, in a way, I guess, like doing a movie. We were in a big space in West London in Park Royal, and we kind of recreated not memory, but actually the mythology of memory. We, we recreated an idea of something. And it's a space, and there's a kind of man in a dressing gown who seemed voyeuristically floats through the, the whole photo shoot. I think I'm perhaps the man in the dressing gown. Um, but we had you know, interest, amazing objects such as this. This is, I think, something for power napping. Um, <laughs> not something that we ever had in the apartment. Um, but this idea of, in a way, a kind of, at least in this shoot, a sort of eroticized life and art blurred boundary in a way a kind of a certain, <clears throat> a certain kind of theater of life and a space in which that theater can take place that was interesting to recreate. I think that's the last picture, Claire. And it, it ended in, in a kind of circus. And when I looked at this picture the other day for the purposes of this, I thought, you know, it ended up very Alan Jones. And of course, Alan Jones was one of those people at you know, that time that I grew up with. Okay. Thank you.